the Joe Rogan experience? I was in college. I was a basketball player, right? And my coach tells tells me, "Hey, Mark, there's there's some European scouts that are that are interested in you. You know, maybe after you know next year, you know, they may want to give you a tryout, European pro basketball, right? But they all say they want to get you. You know, they'd like for you to be a little bigger because of the style they played back then. Okay, so I start lifting weights, trying. You know, I'm six foot eight, two thirty, two forty, which is in in the eighties is huge for a basketball player, but still." So, so I started training. The European League, were they just more physical? Yeah, or? yeah. They, you know, it was like uh, Rick Mahorn and, and Bill Lambeer, you know, on the gas. I mean, mm-hmm. They were just monsters. And um, so I started training, and I'm trying to, you know, put on size and strength. And I met this guy in the gym who was like, every day I'd come in, he goes, hey, he goes, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I'm going to – I'm going to get into this wrestling. I want you to do wrestling with me. And I was a big wrestling fan as a kid. But as I got into, you know, basketball and football and everything else, I kind of, you know, I kind of drifted away. Yeah, and I was just like, eh, man, I think I'm going to go try to play some pro ball in Europe. And, and he goes, ah, man, you should really try and do this with me, you know. So I kind of started getting in touch with the product again. You know, I kind of started watching again. And, you know, I got no clue. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, you know. You know, kind of get fall back into it again, right? I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's different, and I think one of the things that's helped me through my career is is being a, a, a realist in what my talents are and what my talents aren't. And you know, I was like, you know, I kind of start having these conversations with myself, like, even if you do make a team, you know, I mean, how long do you really have? Right, and, and being 21 and sitting on the end of the bench in Lithuania just really didn't, wasn't that appealing yeah. uh, of a, you know, I'm th- you know, I'm trying to weigh it up against what I'm seeing on TV. Right. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, you got the Von Erickson, you got Hogan. And I'm like, well, shit, these guys are huge household names, you know? And so I'm thinking, eh, maybe I ought to give it a try. So we find this guy by the name of Buzz Sawyer to, to train us. Right. And I got to come up with two grand, and I ain't got a pot or a window to throw it out of, right? So I uh, I get my brother, my oldest brother, to co-sign a loan, hawk everything I own, and uh, come up with two grand to pay Buzz Sawyer to train train me to wrestle. Show up to his house, uh, first morning of training, right? And Buzz was a he was a he was a good amateur, really good amateur, and uh, show up at his house, knocking on the door. Knocking on, there's about 10 of us standing out in the fucking front yard, knocking on the door. Finally, fucking door swings open. What the fuck you want, right? And he's standing there butt ass naked. Right? <laughs> Woke him up out of a day. De- he's just standing there naked. And everybody's like, uh, we're here to train. And he goes, oh, fuck, is that today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, so he, he gets a, Another guy that was staying there with him, his name was Perry Jackson, who I'm friends with to this day. Uh, he says, go out there and warm him up, right? So he goes out there, and we run and do all just, I mean, everything they can do to blow us up and run us off, right? Totally gassed out, about two hours, just nothing but cardio shit, right? Finally, Buzz comes out. All right, everybody line up, you know. All right, everybody get down, amateur position, right? So, you know. Everybody gets down, fucking, he just stretches the shit out of everybody, right? Like right, cross-faced, just fucking, you know, chicken wing and just, just hooking everybody and rolling them around in, the, in his front yard, right? It's just, and that, and that was it, right? Then he goes in the house. So y'all come back, you know, a couple other days. So this goes on for weeks. And, like, every time I show up, there's, like, one less guy that shows up, they just like fucking until I was the last one there. Mm. So I'm the last one there. I knock on the door, knock on the door. Fuck. He never answers, right? So I start peering in the windows. Fucking all the furniture's gone. Everything's gone. He's gone. He's gone to a different territory to work. He just left, right? Never, never learned any pro wrestling. <laughs> He was just teaching you wrestling, wrestling. He was just teaching me. Yeah, obviously he, we yeah. signed up for pro, you know to get right. to teach us how to pro wrestle. But he just came out there, and his whole goal, and this is the way it was back then, is they always try to take your money, and then they try to run you off. You know, uh, most of the guys in that era were all shooters. You know, they were all 
you know, they were all good amateurs. Right. And that was what they would do. They would take your money, then they'd hurt you, twist you, hurt, you know, and try and mm -hmm. get you to quit. And they got your money and they're, you know, they didn't have to worry about There's it. There's some wrestling trainers that were famous for like crazy physical training standards before they ever taught you anything. Like Carl Gotch. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you know who Carl yeah. Gotch is. Carl Gotch, who is uh, not just a, a wrestler, but one of the, he's like one of the legends of catch wrestling. Yep. Catch wrestling is like, uh, so it's a lot like submission wrestling that you see in the U in the UFC or in jiu-jitsu, but it's a uh, very like wrestling oriented. So instead of like, whereas jiu-jitsu maybe would be, I don't want to say it's, it's less technical, but it's more violent. Like mm. it's a lot of snapping people down yeah. and cross facing and guillotines and 10 finger guillotines. And there's still a lot of like, um, uh, Sakuraba was like one of the legends of MMA learned yeah. from uh, another catch wrestler in Japan. And the, a lot of guys who, like Josh Barnett is another one, who's a, a big uh, catch wrestling mm -hmm. uh, enthusiast. He, his style yeah. is all, and he, you know, he submitted a lot of like really elite guys. But yeah. Carl Gotch was famous for making, you had, to, you had to be able to do crazy shit. Like I think you had to do a thousand body weight squats. You had to be able to do like you had to do all these things before yeah. you would even teach you yeah. anything. Like you had to be fucking tip top magoo before you would ever get into those ropes. Yeah, absolutely. And that was the, the whole goal was to run you off. You know, weed out the weak. Weed out the weak. Yeah. 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 And then if you went through all of that and you were still there, okay, well this kid, you know, you know, let's see what he, you know, let's see if we can teach him how to do this. But there was that big weed out process, and that mm. was, yeah. I think Buzz's whole deal, his whole deal was a scam from the start. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, he he wanted the money, and he knew, you know, what he, you know, back then we had territories, before Vince kind of, you know, took it nationwide. You know, Texas had a territory, California had a couple of territories, Oregon, you know, and guys just and went two thousand bucks in '86 is a lot, of, a lot of money. Money that's a lot of money for a kid in college on you know on, yeah. a, on a scholarship. Man, I didn't have shit. I I sold everything I owned. You know. So you're fucked. How do you go from there? So uh, you know. I, I lived in my car for a little bit, uh, you know, bounced in bars, collected a little money here and there. I just did whatever I could just to, you know, keep eating and, and keep training and, and, and did, what I, did what I could. And I knew, so the Von Erichs ran Dallas. That was their, that was their, their hub, world-class world championship wrestling. And I knew that they were in the office on Wednesday like they would come in there and book the cards and the guys would come in, get their paychecks and shit on Wednesday. So every Wednesday for about eight months, I would go down there and I'd sit in the lobby and fucking guys would come right, walk right by me. Not even, not even acknowledge my presence. Every Wednesday, every Wednesday for eight months, I went and just sat there and eight months. Did you ask to speak to him? Well, I, yeah. So there was, there was a referee back there. His name was Bronco Lubitsch. He was the only one that would speak to me. Right. And it would be kind of like, yeah, you're here again, huh, kid? And I was like, uh, yes, sir. Mr. Lubitsch. I was, you know, hoping maybe I get a chance to talk to somebody today. All right, well, just good luck, you know? And, and I would sit there and, you know, I'd walk by and try to like, you know, as they, somebody would come through, you know, I'd kind of start to stand. Fuck. They were stopped. Just, it just blew me, blew right by me. One day, at, like I was, I was right at the end of my ride. I was like, fuck, this is not, I'm not getting anywhere here. And uh, Fritz von Erich, you know, the, the, the patriarch of the family, right? The guy that owned the company came in. And he, and he walked in and he stopped and he looked at me. Like, and I started to, you know, once again, I started to get up, you know, and introduce myself. And he turned around and he went into Bronco's office. And he had a deep, gravelly voice, and I could hear him. And he's like, he's like, who's that kid out there? And uh, he said, ah, oh, he's been coming here for months. He's just trying to get booked. And I heard, heard Fritz go, book him. Book him Friday night. I want to see what he can do. He looks just like David, one of his sons that he had lost. I looked, I looked a lot like David, and that's how, that's how I got my first break. Wow. Because I was in the right you know, I was in the right place at the right time. So had you ever practiced? No, I was practicing. practicing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was, but I'd never had a, I'd never had like a real match. Right. I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, every little outlaw, independent kind of deal that I could get, I was doing. 
but I hadn't worked with top guys or, you know. When you say like outlaw independent, like, so you were doing some matches? I was doing some matches, but not, not professional, like not televised, not for, right. a, for a real company. Right. Oh, like, it's just like some jackass, like, okay, I'm a wrestling promoter. I'm going to go to the Knights of Columbus Hall and mm -hmm. see if I can put 20 people in here. You know, that's the kind of shit you would do. And then you have to go for no money. And then, you know, you'd set up the ring, whatever you had to do. But the t the wrestling, the time in the ring was what was so valuable at that point, is getting getting those reps and getting that stuff. So, and then, so they booked me. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of Bruiser Brody. Yes. Yes. Tough guy. Uh, in anybody's standards back then, especially, is my first match. Right. So... <laughs> Now, I, I'm a pretty respectful guy, and, 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 and I'm sure in any industry, you know, even when you, you know, a new comic, you, you pay respect to the older guy. I mean, it's just the way it should be, and, it, and the way it really was back then, especially, you know, in, in our business, you know, you just, you didn't say much, you spoke when spoken to kind of deal. And uh, so I, I'm Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody's my first professional match, right? So, wow. I don't know, I'm 20. 21 maybe and uh i'm you know i'm in the ring and i'm looking at him i'm like fuck i'm bigger than he is <laughs> this is the shit that's going on in my head right <laughs> now i'm so nervous like you couldn't have drove a nail up my ass with a sledgehammer i'm so nervous to start with but i'm looking like that 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 stupid voice in the back of my head's like you're fucking bigger than he is you know because bruiser brody was bigger than life man he had all that hair and he was just fucking he was just a man he was an animal right so fucking uh, bell rings and I, boom, I tie up with him, collar and elbow, and you know I jam him up into a corner. And, you know he's hey kid, lighten up a little bit, kid. You know relax. And I'm just like, I mean my body's like angle iron, right? I'm so just. Ugh. Anyway, so I go to shove him, and my hands, you know, we're, we're kind of hand fighting a little bit, and my hand slips off, and I kind of, you know, I kind of palm him in the in the in the face. Temperature in the room changed a little bit at that moment. <laughs> we t so we tie up again, and I'm, I'm about to shoot him across the ring, and I gotta shoot him across the ring, and I'm yelling like I'm gonna hit him with a clothesline. So as I tell him, clothesline, right? And he comes off the ropes like, like like a bullet, like a six foot five, three hundred pound bullet, and he kicks me square in my fucking jaw. <laughs> My eyes, my eyes roll back in my head, and next thing I know, he's grabbing me. He's like, let's go for a walk, right? So he throws me out of the ring and uh, throws me down on this table. And, and the, this place called the Sportatorium in Dallas, they've torn it down now. But they had the folding chairs that had, they were metal, but then they had the wood slats. Fuck. He takes this chair as hard as he can. You know, and not the, we're not talking about the metal folding chairs, which hurt enough in their own right when you get hit enough times with them. He swings as hard as he can. This chair just fucking explodes. Wood slats fly all over the place. I'm thinking I've, I'd, I'd never been hit so hard, man. I'd been hit, you know, but I'd never been hit that hard by anything at that point. He throws me back in the ring, ties me all up in the ropes, right? I'm greener and shit. Don't know what the hell I'm doing. And he just starts <laughs> hitting the other ropes and coming and just kicking me as hard as he can in the head. Wow. Oh, my God. And I deserved it. I, you know, I mean, he was giving me a lesson that I needed to learn. Anyway, a couple of minutes later, boom, he pins me. And, you know, that was it. We go back, to, you know, we go back to the dressing room. And I'm like, holy shit, I just got the shit kicked out of me. And uh, I went over to him. I was like... Mr. Brody, thank you. You know, he said, "All right, kid, just you know, relax next time, will you?" And I was like, "Yes, sir. I, I just appreciate you know being in the ring with you." And you know, went back off in my corner to kind of gather where I was, and you know, and I could oh, over him telling you know, the promoter, he's like, "Fuck, you ought to you ought to book this kid some more." They were trying to find some place else to send me. He said, "That kid, that kid's going to be something," and. uh but, you know, they, at the time, they, I was too green. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, so I had to go somewhere else. But 
that was my first my first uh, introduction into into wrestling, and I I got thumped pretty good. Catch new episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience for free only on Spotify. Watch back catalog JRE videos on Spotify, including clips. Easily, seamlessly switch between video and audio experience. On Spotify, you can listen to the JRE in the background while using other apps and can download episodes to save on data cost all for free. Spotify is absolutely free. You don't have to have a premium account to watch new JRE episodes. You just need to search for the JRE on your Spotify app. Go to Spotify now to get this full episode of the Joe Rogan Experience.